All right, so um, we're going to get started here. Um, today, Myrene Brown is going to present on uh, how to add fall color to your native plant garden. Uh, Myrene Brown is the owner of Myrene's Garden. She has been planting and experimenting with native plants since her move to Indiana in 1989. In 1998, she started Myrene's Garden, and right. provides garden lectures, garden coaching, and design work for clients. Uh, my name is Brooke Alford. I'm the current president of the Central Chapter of the Indiana Native Plant Society. And thank you all for being here today. I'm gonna turn it over to Myrene here in just a moment. We still have a few people coming in here. Um, but please, during the presentation, if you have any questions, just enter them in the chat. Okay, right now you should be looking at my first title slide and I am going to get rid of these floating controls here so you don't okay. have to see those. And we ought to be about ready to start. My mm -hmm. um, website address is down here. You can access my business email through that if you're interested in contacting me to ask questions or anything. And we're going to get right start, started right away with fall color from natives. I do want to talk a bit about why natives are important. I think Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, does a really good job of explaining why native plants are so important. My takeaway from this book is that our native insects are declining in numbers. And that is what starts our very own food chain. We know that one out of three bites we put in our mouth is only made possible in high crop yields if there is a pollinator around. So we don't want those numbers declining. This is a book based on research. He went out in the field or his grad students did and they counted the number of insects on both native and non-native plants found almost zero to really low counts of insects on non-native plants, but that's quite the opposite when you are talking about native plants. He has two appendixes at the back of the book that are helpful. One of them ranks native plants by their wildlife value, that includes their value to pollinators, and the other tells you the specific host plants needed for certain butterfly and moss species. The butterflies and moss are both very picky eaters. For instance, in the case of a monarch, their caterpillar phase will only eat plants out of the milkweed or Asclepius genus. So if you want to see them, you have to provide that plant on your property if you want to be able to raise young. And a zebra swallowtail is not going to be seen unless you have a pawpaw to support its caterpillar phase. There is an older book. This is the book that really got me interested in native plants. It was written by Sarah Stein, and she basically tells you her metamorphosis from a traditional gardener who bought a property in the country started going to the nurseries and buying the plants that you could typically get at that time, which was primarily plants out of Asia and Europe, and watched the wildlife disappear on her property. She did a little reading, started bringing back native plants, which in turn brought the wildlife back. So I think it is very important to be discussing natives when we're talking about adding color. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the color from especially tree leaves. And we are of course gonna be sticking with natives so that when we, you add something for color, you're also able to support the insects and wildlife that associate with the native trees. There is a small collection of photographs there down at the bottom of insects that were found on my property and photographed. And I think that having butterflies flit around, finding a monarch crystallis on your property add to the color in the fall months. I don't know exactly what dragonfly this is, but it was a beautiful gold coloration and really added movement and extra color into my garden. 
The first tree I want to talk about is a tall upper canopy tree. I'm gonna talk about the maples. I have photographs here of the leaves of three of the four maples that are native to Indiana. So all of these that are shown are going to support wildlife and numerous wildlife, including pollinators. There are many really pretty maples to choose from, but if you have chosen a Norway maple, a Japanese maple, or a paperback maple, they do not have much to offer the pollinators or the wildlife. If you're interested in the tree that you're selecting and whether or not it happens to be native to Indiana, I would recommend doing a Google search. Put in the word range or distribution of, and instead of writing, say, a red maple, use a scientific name. So um, when I did a Google search for Acer rubrum, I got a distribution map to hop up on one of the recommended sites to go to for more information. And hopefully your monitor is big enough so that you can see that Indiana is clearly in the range of the Acer rubrum. There happen to be 12 maple species that are native to North America, four that are native specifically to Indiana. I don't have a picture of the box elder. That is a tree that's pretty rapidly growing and very short lived. So it's not very frequent that somebody chooses that as a landscape tree. Oaks are gorgeous trees that um, support numerous different wildlife species and help a number of different pollinators. Here are just a few that you could choose from. There are, um, if you're interested in who associates with a plant, I would choose the words fauna associated with, and then again, use the genus and species name to get more accurate information about who associates with the oaks, the different oaks. And you have a lot of choices in the oaks. There are 90 species that are native to the US and probably about 18 species that are native here to Indiana. The state tree is um, a tulip proper. It is native, not every state named uh, flower plant is, but the tulip tree is. It is something that will color up a pretty yellow in the fall. It's not going to disappoint you in the spring. It's going to have this tulip looking bloom and that is a bloom that is utilized by the hummingbird and bee species. This is a tree that offers a lot to wildlife. Once that flower is fertilized, you get the seed pod form that is made up of many winged seeds or samaras. And there are numerous bird species and small mammals that will eat these seeds. This tree, if it's drilled in by a yellow bellied sapsucker woodpecker, it can get sap out of it. Sometimes you will even see hummingbirds going to the holes that have been drilled to get some sap. It's a sturdy tree, so its branches can support the raising of younger birds. So this is a great all round wildlife tree that offers a lot to the wildlife with just one specimen planted. So I have symbols here. Um, when I put up the bird symbol, it kind of represents um, just birds in general. The butterfly I'm using often to represent pollinators and that squirrel there for small mammals. Anytime you add another native plant to your garden, you are going to up the quality of both pollinator and wildlife habitat in your yard. Over on the right here, you can see a moth and a butterfly that you will probably be lucky enough to see if you happen to have the tree, the tulip poplar that supports these two species. Here is a sourwood. 
It is a tree that would be a little tough to grow around here because it happens to like acidic well-drained soil. We here are slightly alkaline clay-based soil and it's not a real doubt, drought tolerant tree. But if you put in all the extra time and effort to get something where conditions aren't exactly perfect for its growth here, you get a beautiful tree that blooms in June when there aren't many other trees blooming at all. Those blooms are fragrant. They are loved by bees and other pollinators. Because the honeybee and several of our native bees practice what is called um, flower fidelity. When they are out foraging on a specific day, they keep going back over and over again to the same genus and species when they're collecting pollen. And that's how you get a single source honey. I'm told sourwood honey is delicious. I've never had it, but would be interested in trying it sometime if I can find it. This will support a number of different creatures in your garden. Here is what it looks like when it reaches maturity. It can get quite tall. It's a lovely base shaped and it's red fall foliage usually has a qualifying word in front of it when you read a description, something like brilliant to describe it because it has really nice fall color. Now, if you want a tree that's gonna be easier to grow here, and you still want something that is oftentimes described as stunning red fall color, I would go with the Tupelo, which you'll hear a number of different common names. People call it a sour gum and a black gum also. This tree can get quite tall. It is dioecious, meaning there are both male and female trees. It happens to have good water tolerance. So if it's sitting in kind of a poor drained area in your yard, it shouldn't bother it much. And once you get it established, this tree has pretty good drought tolerance. So it is gonna be easier to grow than the sourwood right here in this part of Indiana. It does bloom, but its blooms are gonna be quite insignificant to you. Not insignificant to all of the pollinators that use it. And with this tree, again, you can get single source honey that's supposed to be really flavorful. Once pollinated, those flowers will turn into these fruiting uh, bluish berries that have seeds inside them. So this is a great plant for feeding birds and other small mammals. It's also going to support caterpillar species with its leaves. And here is one of the caterpillars well, this is actually a moth that you might see if you have the Tupelo on your property. It's the Azalea Springs, Sphinx moth. And you can see it's got appropriate fall colors to flit around your yard if you happen to have it. This is one of my favorite trees. We've dropped down a bit to something that gets called an understory tree because its height is much shorter. This is a tree that in nature, you would oftentimes find it at the edge of the woodlands because it does appreciate oftentimes having a little bit of shade. Mine that I planted was shaded until the neighbor cut down their tall black cherry. It is still doing fine in the um, south and west light that it gets on my property where it is planted. It goes a nice clear yellow in the fall. I think one of the reasons I really love it is because of its fluffy, fragrant white flowers in the month of May. This has both male and female trees. The female, if it is pollinated, you will end up with a bluish berry again that is going to feed bird species. I know one of the two I have is definitely a female because when I bought it at the nursery, it was fruiting. My other one was added bare root and I think I have to get a, it growing a little bit longer before I know for sure if it's a male or a female. Red bud is an understory tree 
It also goes this clear yellow, unless by chance you purchased one of the cultivars, some of them do color up in more orange or wine leaf color. This uh, straight species here that we're looking at is what brings about that nice pink haze early in the spring in our woodlands. The red bud blooms pretty early. Um, there are a number of pollinating species that will visit it. Once it's pollinated, you get formation of pods that look like peas. There are seeds inside of this. So again, you have a plant that's capable of feeding a number of different bird species and supporting a number of pollinators. And to make sure this talk doesn't go too much over one hour, I just on this page have some more suggestions of good understory trees you might want to look into that will bring nice fall color to your property. And we are going to move on to shrubs. And once again, if you select a native, you're going to get for your color, you're going to get more than just visual beauty on your property. You're going to be supporting pollinators and wildlife. I would say my all time favorite shrub is the Father Gila gardenii. It is something that colors up a mix of colors in the falls from yellow to orange to red. And I think is a good replacement for that non-native burning bush, the Euonymus alatus that we really should not be planting. That Euonymus has invaded our woodlands and is degrading our natural area's ability to support wildlife and pollinators. You can get some height variation from the father galas depending on what species you select. Gardenii is the shortest. All of them get these short white bottle brushes on them in the spring that are going to be very attractive to pollinators. The Gardenii tops out about three to four feet. I think the reason I have always claimed this is my favorite shrub is the first one I got, which I sourced from Bluestone Perennials, never needed any pruning of any kind. It topped out at about three and a half feet. Um, I never had to cut off wayward branches. It never did any suckering. I bought three of them for my new property and it turns out the ones I sourced from a local nursery do sucker. So on occasion, I have to go and pull on those suckers and clip them closer to the center of the shrub to keep the shrub looking nice. So if you want the low maintenance one, I would think about sourcing out of the Bluestone perennial catalog. All of them are going to have these gorgeous blooms on them. So it is easy to love. If you want that deeper red of a burning bush, the form of an Itea virginica is not quite as spot on as maybe a Father Gila is, but the color is more that brilliant red of the um, Euonymus that we really should not be planting. The Virginia Sweet Spire goes pretty much red when it's finished its coloration. It is a plant that is known to sucker some. So it does require a little bit of maintenance to keep it in bounds. We're looking at Henry's Garnet, a shorter version that tops out at about two and a half to three feet, but there's different um, cultivars out there that will give you a height range if you choose an Itea to bring in the red color. Iteas are often said to be reluctantly deciduous, meaning their leaves hold on for quite some time. So you get to view their red coloration longer than you might the coloration of some plants. These uh, bottle brush brooms, blooms are a little bit skinnier and more elongated than the Father Gila, but just as gorgeous and just as attractive to all the pollinators. This uh, plant needs about six hours of sun to really get its good coloration going. It will tolerate a fair amount of shade, but as you go into more and more shade, it does flower less and not um, color up as well in the fall.
For the suckers on this, again, I grab them, I pull on them until the branch pops up out of the soil, usually before I get back to the center where the shrub is forming from. There's roots attached. It's an easy way to get an extra free plant to pass along to someone else or put somewhere in your garden. It's wet tolerant, making it appropriate for a rain garden or the place maybe where all your downspouts are directed in your yard. The um, plant likes slightly acidic soil and it will make seed pods from those spring blooms. I tend to cut the spring blooms off so less energy of the plant goes to forming seeds and the plant stays fuller. Sometimes a Itea can look a little bit um, sparse as far as leaves go, but if you take the um, finished spent flowers off of it, more energy goes into branching out. I am told that birds will come eat the seeds if you leave them on, but since I don't, I've never seen a bird at mine. I like the Durvilla shrub because it is such a tough shrub. I had the straight species, Dervilla lonicera at my prior property. And it also is a shrub that will do some suckering. So again, I would yank on those suckers that got away from the center of the shrub and pull them up. One of the suckers I took up, I planted in a plastic, a black plastic flimsy gallon nursery container. And I wasn't sure where I wanted to put it. So at the other property, it lived two years in this gallon container in the winter, just out in its location in the garden and survived, which is pretty amazing because to survive a container in the winter and still grow next spring, you need to be hardy two zones colder than our zone, we're zone five. So that means you have to be hardy to zone three. When I went to move into my new house, I brought that Dervilla Lonicera with me. And because I moved into a full sun, totally blank landscape, no shade whatsoever because the house had been renovated, I utilized the shrub to, to move it around whenever I planted a new plant to give it a few days of shading from the Dervilla so that it could settle in and without having a hot sun hit it. This one you're looking at on the right colors up quite bright red. It is a cultivar called Firefly Night Glow. It, like all the Dervillas, has a yellow tubular flower. It's pretty hard to see amongst all the foliage, so here's a close-up. This is loved by hummingbirds and bees, even though it's not a big significant uh, bloomer for us. This is a cross of two of the Davila species, Sassifolia and Lonicera. They're giving that cross a third species name, Splendens. The Proven Winners Company, which is basically a branding and plant promoting company, has been promoting Davila the last couple of years. They have what they call the Kodiak series of red of, I should start with the colors as they're listed over to the left is Kodiak orange, then red and then black. The claim to fame of these is that they hold their color longer into the year. The one on the left here, this Kodiak orange is basically the color of my straight species. The straight species pretty much only has it on the newest growth, which then fades to green. And even these name cultivars, they will fade to a green tone when our temperatures get really high into the 90s. But all of these will then in the fall when the temperatures drop, day length shortens, are going to deepen that color of their new spring growth and be very pretty in the fall. And if you need a tough plant that you can ignore in the category of shrubs, I think this is a good one. It has long arching stems, but since it blooms on new wood, you can trim it to any height you like and still get the flowers on it. 
This Dravilla splendens is said to be hardy down to zone four. I think the um, Dravilla lonicera must certainly be hardy all the way down into zone three. This is another way to get fall color from a shrub, not only from the leaves, but also from the berries that show up later um, in the season. They begin to color up from the green that they start at into a red, if you happen to have a red choke berry. This will not disappoint you in the spring because you are going to see blooming on it, which again is going to support a number of different pollinating species. Those fruits are going to support a number of birds. Um, small mammals are going to come in and feed off the fruits. In fact, unfortunately, chokeberry is known to be something that oftentimes rabbits will eat the twigs of. Here is the black chokeberry. Again, you get nice fall color up followed by blueberries, which eventually deepen into almost a black color. It will bloom in the spring for you. It supports pollinators, supports um, small mammals, supports bird species, and it also supports caterpillar species. So on the side there, you will see different uh, butterflies and moths. You may get to see if you have this on your property. And it's easier to see the value of having a caterpillar on your plant eating some of the leaves when you think of that as free bird seed on your property. This is, has, the berry is actually edible to humans. I didn't realize that until Susan Conaway made a comment on Facebook that her aronia had buried up so heavily, she had lots of extras and she welcomed anybody to come on her property and pick them to use in baked goods. I uh, made a comment on Facebook back saying I had no idea they were edible and she, and she commented again back to me that you won't think they are if you go out and eat one raw at the bush, which I went out and tasted one and it was a very acrid tasting, I think it's maybe the right word, just in the same manner as cranberry. I used one of the recipes Susan put out on Facebook to make a quick bread that had orange peels in it. I have the sugar from what it was called for, but the bread was delicious. And if I hadn't made it, I would have thought it was a cranberry bread. You really can't tell the difference, but there are tons of different vitamins and minerals. They're listed down on the bottom left there that you will get if you consume the berries. The birds kind of wait late in the season until they've fermented a bit. I don't think it's their favorite berry because of all the, um, that tartness in it. I think we better mention a shrub for people who have all shade. This is a bottle brush buckeye. It actually is not that happy in full sun because the leaves will burn some. It's most happy in partial shade. You get quite a lot of blooming when you're in partial shade, but you can take it into very deep shade and you'll still get some blooming, just not as heavily. Fall color up is probably better with a bit of sun. It goes yellow. Those um, long sort of bottle brushes are going to pull in a lot of pollinators. Hummingbirds love this. They spend a lot of time with all those individual flowers that make up that long candelabra collecting nectar. It will, once pollinated, go on to form a knot, starts out green, and in the end will be kind of a glossy dark brown, which um, looks nice against the yellow foliage of the plant. This prefers moist soil and acidic soil. So I want to pass on a tip. It's known that the pH of soil will affect fall leaf color. For instance, in the maples, if it's growing in acidic soil, you're gonna get a more brilliant red than if it happens to be 
in a more alkaline or neutral soil, it's going to have more yellow tones in it to tone it down more, maybe into yellow coloration. So after a fall rain, when I know the soil is pretty saturated, so now is actually a good time, I go out and I take my vinegar and put basically a couple of shot glasses, maybe around four ounces. I just pour away into a gallon jug of water. It doesn't ma matter what brand you use, whether it's white or cider vinegar, I just always look for the 5% acidity. I save milk jugs, I will fill up a bunch of them and prep them all at the same time while I'm at the hose and then start going around my yard, putting this acidified water onto the root zones of quite a few of my plants because I have a number of things that prefer a more acidic soil, like the Father Gila we talked about, the Itea, the Bottle Brush Buckeye. Of our shrubs, I think the most popular ones around here that are native tend to be acid lovers and get a better color up if you do this. You may be wondering why I don't do what the garden books advise, which is usually to take some sulfur type product out and put it around the soil surface um, along the root zone. I don't always have sulfur in my garage, but I always have vinegar in my house. And that way, um, when the mood strikes me, when it rains and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this would be a good day to acidify my shrubs. I'm all set because I, vinegar is always in my house. I will also do this not only in the fall, but usually once in the spring. Some of the shrubs like the Itea can get a little chlorotic looking to their leaves if we have a lot of rain in the spring. And if you acidify the soil so they can get better iron uptake, they tend to look nicer. So oftentimes do this twice a year. And, you know, I don't measure, I just pour away and it's always worked out well for me. Here is another shrub that likes slightly acidic conditions. This is Lindera benzoin, our native spice bush. It will go a really pretty yellow color. And if you want to see a spice bush swallowtail butterfly, you need to have this on your property. This is another plant that's dioecious. It has both male and female plants. To get these berries, you're going to need to have a female plant that gets um, cross-pollinated with a male. Here's just a handful of those spice bush swallowtail caterpillars that feed off the leaves of this to remind you that you have several sources of bird food when you grow this shrub, not only the berries, but also the caterpillars of this spice bush swallowtail. That is oftentimes the primary food source for the songbirds in the spring months when they're raising young. The shrub won't disappoint you in the spring. It flowers a uh, yellow that is the exact same color as a forsythia, just a more delicate flower than a forsythia. And it, unlike our forsythia, supports a lot of our native pollinators, but it blooms at the exact same time, which to me makes it a good substitute for a forsythia. There are 20 species of birds that will feed on the berries of this. In fact, those berries that are so gorgeous that you probably wish would hang around into the winter because they are so shiny and glossy, have such a uh, good flavor and high fat content that the birds pick them off very quickly. If you just put this one shrub on your property, you have added the ability to feed a number of different species with just this one plant. And I do think it's something to think about if you want to go native and you would really miss the blooming of a forsythia. We've discussed uh, about half the color wheel for getting color into your garden. Let's talk about bringing some purple color into the garden. You can do that with the American beautyberry shrub. It is Calicarpa Americana. 
Um, there are other species of this you want to be careful if you're buying from a nursery to make sure you get the American one. I am told the American one is prettier than either the Japanese or Chinese beauty berry. They have long arching stems. And again, this is something that blooms on new wood. So you can control the height, you can clip it off anywhere and still get the flowering, which when um, pollinated will make these purple berries that contrast with the foliage that goes rather yellow in the fall. The flowers are gonna be pretty insignificant to you but not to the wildlife that are, that are interconnected with this plant. The Ilex verticulata are native holly species that is deciduous, so it drops its leaves, will have a bright red berry late in the season. That's a nice contrast with the yellow that um, the leaves turn in the fall. If um, this has a male to pollinate it and you have a female specimen, because again, this is a dioecious plant, you can get very heavy um, berry loads out of this plant, especially if you have its um, favored cultural conditions. This is a plant that likes water. It's gonna do very well in a rain garden, in a soggy spot in your yard. It does like, slight some acidic soil. So it might be one that you might want to consider acidifying with either sulfur or vinegar water as it fall season approaches. It has a late spring bloom, which is going to be helpful for pollinators. Um, it's going to support a lot of bird species. You probably won't notice its blooms because they are not very significant to our eyes, but the pollinators are very happy with this. This will support a number of different creatures. Brown is another color you can bring in to your garden. Um, that's oftentimes best done with the trunks of trees, with some of the very interesting bark on shrubs, such as a nine bark or an oak leaf hydrangea. Ground cover, I think, is very important to garden design. It really helps to have a mass of one color to set off your perennials. And I have to say, I love the look of lightly frosted grass. Now grass is not native. Um, it won't absorb much water. It has very little value for wildlife. I've been experimenting with a sedge called Carax jamesii as a lawn substitute. I cut an oval of grass out of my small lawn in the back and inserted plugs of Carax jamesii. So far, I'm quite happy with how the Carax jamesii is responding to being mowed, just like the rest of the lawn. It seems to tolerate the fertilizer, although if the whole lawn was made out of that, I don't think I would need to fertilize. It holds up better when we go into drought. So that may in the future provide me with a more wildlife friendly means to have that design element that we so oftentimes grasp for to set off other plantings. We're going to move on then to talk about some of the native ground covers that can bring fall color. In this slide here, I have um, Allegheny Pachysandra at the top. This is a much more interesting plant than the Asian Pachysandra, which doesn't change much throughout the season. This one does. It gets very, um, it gets a nice bottle brush bloom that's very fragrant in the spring. Then you have bright lettuce um, green leaves emerging from the year round leaves that as temperatures drop in the fall, this veining in them gets more and more distinct, turns more and more silver, and you have a very nice mottled leaf to go into the winter months with. Down at the bottom here is winter green. This is another year round leaf 
for an Indiana gardener. It will make berries. This, yeah, this is not berries from the wintergreen. This is from a female Jack in the pulpit. This is the fruits that were made with the seeds inside. This wintergreen also has some red stems to add a little bit of color, but as temperatures drop, the green leaves on the wintergreen get a little bit of blush to red to them, and they do also bury up in a nice bright red berry. I could not be without the prairie smoke. I find this to be such an interesting plant. And again, you have leaves that are around all season long. If you go out in the winter months and pick up the leaves and look underneath them, you will find these buds underneath hugging really tight to the soil. They're there um, probably about mid January, because by the time you get to late February, they start to lift up out of the foliage. Here is a picture taken February 26th, and you can see these buds have lifted up out of this foliage that did get a red wash to it um, during the winter. Those will get taller and taller until you have the bloom standing on about an eight inch stem above the ground. These older leaves just kind of lay down flat against the ground and provide sort of a mulch around the plant and then new leaves emerge from the center crown. Here is a picture from Fine Gardening. There, uh, this is such a nice plant vignette. I had to save uh, the picture of this. This is a picture of the red chokeberry underplanted with Ansonia ubrechtii. This was taken in the fall when you have the red color of the chokeberry's leaves along with the red berries. Chokeberries, like the bottle brush buckeye, can get a little bare legged underneath, meaning the leaves don't go all the way to the ground and you have kind of this blank space for a bit between the ground where there's dust stems before the leaves start, which gives you an opportunity to, to underplant like they have done here. And here that choice of the Amsonia hubrechtii, in my opinion, is perfect. There are several different hubrecht um, species of Amsonia that are native, the Hubrechtii and the Tabernay Montana. Both have pretty fine leaves. The Hubrechtii has the finest leaf. Um, this one is more like a willow leaf, only smaller. They're both a good way to bring texture into a garden and also get a yellow to goldish fall color. This looks really nice in a mass planting in the fall as shown here on the slide on the left. They both bloom up with a blue bloom in the, um, it's probably mid to late spring. The flowers are star-shaped, hence the common name, which is blue star. This is going to support pollinators since it's native, a number of different creatures. Um, you won't have, have uh, bunnies or squirrels eating the green foliage and stems of this plant because it has a toxic sap inside of it. That makes that little vignette from the prior slide seem like it might even serve the purpose. If a bunny hops up and is surround, has that Amsonia surrounding the aronia, it might protect an aronia shrub from browse. It might be an experiment worth trying on your own property. Both of these make upright held seed pots. On the Tabernay Montana, you get quite a lot of germination around your plant to the point of being weedy. So I consider the Hubrechtii the five-star plant. Maybe I'd give the other one like three stars to two stars. It's very appropriate if you have a huge property and you don't mind it um, having seeds starting and wandering through maybe a huge meadow. But for myself and most clients, I would only plant this Hubrechtii because it is much better behaved. There are much fewer seed pods to cut off if you don't want it seeding out. And 
Um, I don't think the germination rate is probably as high. Goldenrod is a very uh, late season bloomer. There are about 80 different species of this North American plant. I have photographs of four different ones shown. Um, these that are shown here are all clump formers. And that is all I would plant when I was planting a goldenrod. They look nice in the fall. They are up at the top of the list of pollinator supporting plants. They also support birds, which eats, eat the seeds. Here is a mass planting of it. So you can see how nice it looks when you put in more than one, although some of them form quite a large clump and can be um, a specimen of one can make a statement in a garden. This one is Solidago canandensis, and I do not like this plant at all. It is a plant that has rhizomous roots that will trail out and then pop up wherever they like. Um, I find this plant very obnoxious if the root travels along and it pops up maybe right in the center of my twin leaf planting that I'm trying to have um, enlarge. This is very aggressive plant that can take other plants out and it'll send out roots in all directions, maybe even popping up in the middle of my father Gila shrub where it's hard to remove and makes the shrub look really silly having this waving yellow coming out of the top of it. So whenever I get gifted one of these plants because I don't like its rhizomous growth, I pull it out. And almost always you will get these in a garden because of visits from birds. I think it germinates quite easily. And I just pulled one the other day from my front garden. Here is another late, late bloomer. This is Boltonia asteroides. At my prior property, I had the cultivar snowbank. I was always very happy with it. About, must have been about 15 years ago, it was very easy to find a Boltonia in a local nursery. Now you just cannot find them. I've been looking for it for a couple of years for this property. I finally gave up and ordered it, which meant I got straight species. I either ordered from Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon. And I'm not sure, even though this is a wonderful plant, that this one is going to get to stay with me. It blooms late, which I like. It has small flowers, but because it flowers in such mass, as you can see from the center photograph, it puts on quite a show that supports many of the pollinators. The problem I have with it is that it tends to flop. It's got a lot of bees on it, but my Boltonia right now is laying on other plants so they can't get sunlight or laying all the way on the ground. And I think I may end up pulling this plant and looking harder for one of the um, cultivars, that snowbank maybe, which stayed upright for me. So these grow tall, maybe to about five feet. They really need full sun to have sturdy enough stems to support them. My old cultivar snow bank was in a partially shaded site. The one I have now is in full sun and I'm a little disappointed in it. So we'll see how long I keep it. Um, I, I do think this is a great fall flower and I will be looking for the cultivar. With the asters, again, you have a large uh, group of plants that flower late. I would say with the asters, just pick your favorite based on size and color. I really like the Radon's favorite one. I think it has a really nice blue tone at a good height. It blooms late in the season. October Skies is another late bloomer, blooms in October. They're gonna be very supportive of native pollinators. Um, you can see a bee on the photo to the left and a monarch on the photo to the right. It'll, it'll be opening its bloom soon and be able to support those late migrating um, monarchs on their way to Mexico. When I first moved to this property, I put some mums on the east 
on the on the west side of my front garden and on the east side I put in asters the asters always have a lot of insects on them I have never seen even one insect on the mum I'm slowly trying to reduce the numbers of mums on the west side and get more aster species that offer more in the way of habitat we have already talked about green some as a color in a garden, especially as we go into winter, it is really nice to see some green. Bringing in a plant like Christmas fern is going to give you green even through the winter months. There are other ferns that look nice in the fall, but they get pretty tattered and don't look good after the first frost. But before then, they are, they are still a nice spot of green in the garden. There are other ways to bring native green into yard with like white pine, the native species of arborvitae or hemlock will work well with that. And of course, there's always moss. Um, that is a beautiful color of green. That's nice to have an area in your yard where there's some moss. It'll probably really make you smile in um, the late fall. The hookara and tiarella and the crosses from those two genera, the hookarella, are year-round foliage plants. There's been a lot of breeding work. You have a choice of um, several different um, color choices, and they make great all-year-round plants. Their color deepens up in the fall, so they're very pretty in the fall months. I want to mention um, one of the invasion problems in our woodlands comes from the invasive Asian strain of bittersweet. Um, sometimes nurseries have this mislabeled. I want you to know how to tell the difference between our native one, which um, is fine in a woodlands versus that invasive one. With our natives, they will only flower at the tip, which means you will only get the berries at the tip, they will still be just as beautiful as the invasive Asian one, but not with flowers and berries up and down the entire stem. About maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was all this talk of the new American garden. Um, it seemed to be characterized by a lot of use of miscanthus and also sedums like um, Autumn Joy. Neither one of those plants happen to be native to the United States. The Miscanthus, there are some um, issues with it showing up in natural areas now because birds do eat the seeds of it. And it is a hard plant to control. Its clump gets bigger and bigger and bigger over the years and it's very hard to make that clump smaller because it's really hard to dig down into the roots. I read in a book that when it's time to divide the miscanthus, it's time to sell the house. So I think it's much more appropriate to bring in native grasses if you're trying to have um, the new American garden look. Here is one that I'm fond of. It is Blonde Ambition. It is a cultivar out of the Denver Botanic Gardens. You have to be careful when you cite it to make sure it has pretty good drainage underneath it so that it can make it through our winters which are, which are wetter than what you would see in Denver. This is commonly called eyebrow grass because the inflorescence hang out like an eyebrow. They're kind of fluffy, bushy at the end of the stem. I have a lot of people that stop at my house and look at this for a while. It seems to be something that interests a lot of people as they walk by. It will support insect species, including grasshoppers, which I must admit I'm not real fond of. Since I do have a fair number of native grasses, I have a fair number of grasshoppers on my property. I don't know if they have bad eyesight or what the deal is with them, but when I go close to the grasses and disturb them, they tend to hop up and bang into me instead of moving away like most other insects. I try and be tolerant by remembering those grasshoppers are free bird seed on 
bird food on my property. This is another one of our native grasses that is a low grower. It tops out basically no taller than a foot. If you look at the um, seeds at the tip of the stems, they have a pink color. In fact, I used a, a way to copy this pink to get this title up here, the same pink as the seed heads on this. It gives a nice sort of pinky purple wash to this grass late in the season. It looks best when you have more than one. It makes more of a statement. Here you can see a, a triangulated planting of three of them on my property. Um, here it is backed up from the property looking at it. And if you look carefully, you will see um, that I did sort of triangulated plantings. You can easily for, see four of them, but there's a fifth one over here. So that I've sort of held to that design rule of using plants in odd numbers, which I do think is most attractive to the human eye. This kind of gives you an idea too of the height of this eyebrow grass here. It tops out maybe close to three feet, just a little bit under that. Both of those are fun grasses to utilize in a landscape to have um, that the grasses oftentimes peak at, in fall and I think having that pink wash and the eyebrow inflorescence really adds to a garden. Now we're looking at little blue stem. This is a native that tops out at about three feet in height. Straight species to me is a real flopper. Right when it colors up and is most beautiful, it is often laying flat on the ground. There are a number of selected cultivars of little blue stem. With the cultivars, they have often fo focused on things like getting more upright growth of the plant, maybe a deeper bluish green for the summer months and then a earlier, brighter, multi-toned um, blades for fall coloration. The photo on the left there is in my garden. Um, it's sitting there along with another late season blooming plant, the pink turtle head. That happens to be the dwarf cultivar. It begins with a T, I think it's torta. I'd have to look it up, I don't remember for sure. But the little blue stem is definitely standing ovation. Over to the right is a picture of it at a client's home along with Helianthus autumnale, another choice of a late season flowering plant. And I like the cultivars better in this case because they do stay up upright when this grass hits, in my opinion, its peak beauty later in the fall. Those seed heads will get fluffy eventually, birds will come in and eat them. This switchgrass here will also support a lot of songbirds from its seed heads, which are a open kind of fluffy inflorescence. With this again, there are a number of named cultivars. Heavy metal has a deeper bluish wash to the foliage. Shenandoah colors up red earlier than a lot of the switch grasses. North wind stays very upright, even on a windy site. Ruby ribbons, prairie sky, Cheyenne sky, all have a red coloration. This is gonna support grasshoppers, songbirds. The grasshoppers are gonna support the birds. The caterpillars that associate with this are also going to support bird species. This is broom sedge. It was utilized at a sculpture garden that's on the Hudson. It has a very upright vertical growth. They planted huge meadows of this grass that goes kind of an orangey buff color in the fall. It's green during the growing season and these sculptures, outdoor sculptures are dotted amongst the broom sedge on the property. So that's a property that's going to help support um, birds and also look especially nice 
in the fall because of that orangey buff color. And there's probably a fair number of grasshoppers out on that property, which are also going to feed the birds along with the caterpillar species that associate with this grass. Turkey foot is one of our taller grasses. Again, a number of selected cultivars. There are oftentimes after a specific color tone when they select these cultivars. Here is a grass for shade lovers or who have shade. Um, most of the grasses we've mentioned so far cannot be grown on a shady site. This northern sea oats can be. There's actually one named cultivar river mist, which has a variegation on the leaves. And if you have this planted in the shade, it kind of looks like sunlight is, is peeking through and hitting this grass. The straight species is very pretty, and especially in the fall when these seed pods go this bronzy gold color. This is going to support caterpillars and birds. Um, it grows well in the shade. In fact, if you take it into the sun, the foliage will burn up some. It tends to be a plant that gardeners either love or they absolutely hate it. I fall on the love it side. I have many garden friends who hate this plant because all of these seed pots here, if left on through the winter, when our winds come in about late December, um, early January, these kind of shatter, get blown around. It seems to have a very high germination rate. You will probably end up with lots of little seedlings to plunk out of the ground if you're a bit controlling of your garden like I am. Um, I have planted it at my old property in a location where I walk by it and always remember to cut it off come late December, utilizing those pretty seed heads sometimes on Christmas packages, but all those seed heads need to be down before the wind starts to blow so that you don't make extra work for yourselves. Prairie drop seed is kind of a mid-height um, grass, about three feet tall. It goes a pumpkin orange color in the fall. There's supposedly a dwarf cultivar out there. I've never seen it for sale. The tall one, um, I would do better on my smaller garden with this smaller cultivar. But as I said, I've never seen it for sale. It is a way to add a nice fine texture into your garden to offset uh, larger leaved plants. There has, like there's always been, there's been a lot of breeding work with garden plants. A lot of cultivars have been bred for or just selected from populations out in the wild. I believe Doug Tallamy is doing research on the value of some of the cultivars and whether or not they're still capable of supporting pollinators. I know a lot of people in the Indiana Native Plant Society stick strictly with straight species, whereas there are other people like myself who will utilize cultivars. There, um, I'm going to tell you a little tale about the prairie clover in my yard. I bought three of them from George Peregram of Native Plants Unlimited. I did the pre-order and so they were selected for me when I got my threesome and brought them back and planted them. I had one that was very upright and stayed very upright. I had two of them that were not very strong stemmed. They fairly quickly flopped over in the garden and laid on the ground. After growing them for one season, I decided I was very disappointed in the floppers, pulled out the two out of three some that were floppers. The next year I asked George if possibly he would be ordering extra trays of the purple prairie clover because I wanted two more, but I wanted to select them myself because I wanted to get upright growers. When I got out there to pick up my pre-order, he indeed had a tray and a half for me to select my extra prairie clover from. A tray usually holds about 48 plants, so I had around 60 some plants to choose from, and I only found one prairie, purple prairie clover that was upright to add to my garden. 
Um, I think the conclusion I have made that is that the highest number of seed grown prairie clovers tend to be weak stemmed and flop. It's more rare to get a seed grown that's very upright and stiff. But I like this one better. If there was a named cultivar that was going to guarantee me that it would stay upright, I would buy it in this instant because I really don't think the flopper adds much to my garden design. There is a drawback. Anytime you are purchasing a cultivar, you are purchasing something that is probably clonally propagated, which means they all have the same gene, especially if all the nurseries in town carry the exact same um, clonally propagated cultivars, the gene pool of the plant is going to shrink. The plant population as a whole is going to be less likely, especially in garden plants that have been purchased from nurseries to adapt to changing climate conditions. However, sometimes there's a bonus. Natives are usually selected for a specific trait. Maybe they produce more flowers, maybe a brighter colored flower, um, maybe a stiffer stem so they're held more upright. And I think it is easier to get people who are not already strong proponents of native plants interested in natives if they see a plant that fits more their idea of a traditional gardener, garden plant. I have had people say about gardens that are planted and certified as a wildlife habitat. I've, I've heard people say, oh, I think that's a gardener who just doesn't want to maintain their garden. Um, I think to catch the people who are used to more traditional gardens, get them interested in specific plants, that is a role sometimes that these um, cultivars of plants can help us with. I do try and be an ambassador to native plants. I will oftentimes get out my chalk and draw and make an arrow to the native plant that it is in bloom. I like it when something like that blonde ambition catches the eye of a more traditional gardener and they stop and ask me what it is because they're interested in planting it in their own yard. This is the last slide. I'm sure I'm at an hour or slightly over. I do want to play a short video with sound for you. Um, do keep your eyes open for numerous pollinators on this plant. I think it's worthwhile to write down the um, genus name and species name of this plant because I think you might want it for your own garden. I consider it a must. -have. Today, I want to show you one of the last liatrices that bloom in my yard. This tall, very upright liatris here doesn't start blooming until uh, early September, early to mid September. And it is a plant that just like all the other liatris species, the monarch butterfly really enjoys. I have quite a few in, of these liatris that are called the savanna liatris in bloom right at the moment. And if you look carefully, you will see there are quite a few monarchs flitting around the liatris in the yard. Here's another monarch over here. And if you look very carefully um, in the distance there, you can probably see some monarchs flying around and then resettling on the liatris. This time of year of my seven liatris species, only the savanna blazing star and this short little button blazing star here. And I have one here and the third one over here are in bloom. The little button liatris is a new addition to the garden this year. This savanna blazing star I have had for several years now, and I do try and make sure I have more and more of them each year because look how happy the monarchs are on this plant and it's getting close to the time of year 
when they not need to migrate and they need some nectar to tank up on before they make the long journey down to Mexico. Well, I hope that uh, video and this one that's running right now convince you that this is a must-have plant. The reason I consider it must-have is the Savannah Blazing Star reaches its peak bloom time right when I have peak population numbers of monarchs in my yard, which usually occurs about September 10th. That is the time when I have the highest number of monarchs that have gone from egg to butterfly on my own property. And also when I have flocks of monarchs flying overhead that see the purple drop down and spend maybe three, four days in my yard while they tank up before they continue their journey south to Mexico. So with that, that is my last slide and I will exit out of this. So um, we get back to the combined screen. Thank you, Myreen. That was fabulous. So much, so much information, just packed chock full and beautiful, beautiful photos as well. Thank you. So we do have some questions for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and present everything that came up and then when I'm done with that, you are getting a lot of applause out there, Myrene. I hope you're seeing that. Um, when I'm done with the Q and A, well, uh, you, you're welcome to turn off your turn on your mic and, and ask some questions too. Thank you so much. So um, on the Gaultheria procumbens, there's some real interest in that. Um, does it spread into a carpet? Is it the kind of ground cover that can really spread into a nice carpet? I, I think so. I haven't had mine very long and I have gotten enlarging clumps. I started last year with fairly small little piece. I believe I got it at Rosie's. It's, the original is about like this. And that's even with me going in, pulling off parts off the side and putting it in another spot. So I, and those ones I've transplanted are also like this only um, two seasons out. So yes, I think so. And it's really fun to see that bright red um, in the area that it's growing and to actually see green in the winter. I actually did not know it was a native here. I planted it back in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area and it's beautiful and it did really spread nicely. So I'm gonna have to experiment with that here yeah. as well. And I didn't pull up the range map of that. I do know it's native to the US. I don't know if it's technically native into Indiana. What I do know is it will grow well here. Okay, good Growing to know. Um, and then um, Barbara asked, uh, does it, is it shade? Is it acidic or alkaline? And do you have any ideas for sourcing it? Um, Rosie's, as I mentioned, had it. I um, was told by several friends, but I already had it, that Lowe's had it. And oftentimes the plants that people don't know don't sell quickly. So word went out that it was really cheap at Lowe's. Um, oh. So several people bought it late at the year from Lowe's. It, um, I would have to look up what its preference of soil conditions are. Um, I'm in the village of Zionsville. Um, the soil is fairly decently draining here. Um, it is fine with me not treating the soil at all, so it can obviously grow in slightly alkaline conditions. Um, and mine is getting shaded by a garage. It gets a fair amount of sun. So it seems like it's a fairly adaptable plant. I think if you look up its um, preferred uh, cultivation, um, that you would find that you could probably play around and take it maybe into more sun than is advised. Take it in, I'm guessing it might like acidic soil, but it's fine with my um, slightly alkaline soil. 
Yeah, I know that, um, again, my experience with it was in the Seattle area and, and Washington State is known for alkaline soil. And um, my experience with it also, I had planted it in the shade under, in an understory um, on the north side of a house, you know, dappled light kind of right. environment. Yeah. And okay. the plant we're talking about is commonly called wintergreen which may be how you find it labeled at low. It's, I'll probably mess up the pronunciation. It's Galthura is the genus name. And I probably mispronounced that. The, um, I, it's Galtheria, right? Galtheria. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'm a horrible speller, so yeah. horrible at pronunciation. Yeah, that's okay. I think you had it listed in your presentation. It's um, G-A-U-L-T-H-E-R-I-A, Galtheria Shalom. No, yeah. Shalom, not Shalom, Procumbens. Procumbens, right. Yes. Okay, moving on. Is the native wild ginger evergreen? Um, yes, it is. So that's another uh, possibility. It doesn't color up in the fall, which is part of the reason it wasn't mentioned in this talk. To me, unlike what happens with it in a woodlands, I consider it a very aggressive plant. I've tried to be very careful about where I put it. When I brought it to this property, I tried surrounding it underneath the ground in the soil with um, the bloodroot. I sort of, I put one, um, of I put just only one piece of ginger in the center and then surrounded it on three sides because then it was up against the garage and the cement base to try and keep it in place. Um, and I haven't had it getting too wild, but I keep my eye on it and I pull mm -hmm. out any pieces that wander a bit further than I like. Because at my old house, it just went all over taking other plants out as it expanded. And I certainly don't want it taking out my twin leaf or, or some of the other plants planted. And it's odd, if you go into a woodlands, you'll never see like six feet of it, like was happening at my, my garden at the prior property. You usually just see a nice patch that's maybe two feet by two at the most. And I'm not sure why that is. The only thing I can guess is that the underground, there's a lot of other bulbous, um, rhizomous things down there to stop it. I'm not sure. I find that to be the case with so many of our natives. They perform a lot differently in the garden than in nature. Yeah. You know, our prairie plantings and everything. Um, great, thank you. Let's see. Um, I know we had some more questions. Just let me get to them. Is there also a purple Boltonia? Not that I know of, but I'm not familiar with all of the cultivars. I believe um, the straight species is almost always white, but there must have been some out there that had a pink wash. I mean, it is a light pink, you know, that, that I think it's the cultivar name is Pink Beauty. It's not a deep pink by any means. And for some reason, they have totally sort of disappeared out of our local nursery trade. You can't find the cultivars anywhere locally. Um, I don't know if you'd have an easy time even finding them if you went to mail or order sources, which is why I ended up with the straight species and I thought it would be fine. I've only had it in for two seasons and I have to say I'm really disappointed with its flopping because as a garden designer, not just somebody who loves um, wildlife, I am picky about what the gardens look like. Understood. Um, hey, back on the wintergreen plant, uh, Lisa Meek said that Native Plants Unlimited has it, <clears throat> and tomorrow is the last day for their sale. So um, get it while you can if you want it. Yeah, because it is a nice plant. I think you'd be very happy with it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and a few people are asking if, um, if a recording is going to be available, and yes, 
Uh, we are recording right now and that will go over to Wendy Ford. She'll edit it for us and make it available. And we'll send a link out to um, everybody who registered. And Wendy, it'll be on the website as well, correct? It will be on the YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, I wanted to mention, um, thank you for your discussion on Native Ours. Um, I think that, you know, that that's a discussion that's always going around. And um, I think it's right. good to know where, you know, they're really useful and where they're not. <clears throat> Do know that Doug Tallamy has, um, is doing some research on there. I shared in the link uh, or in the chat, a link to a discussion with him regarding his research. It's been a while since I heard that in a podcast a couple of years ago, but um, I think uh, leaf color has a lot to do with um, whether or not it will attract and support our insects and stuff. I think that um, red um, is not good in cultivars for some reason. It does not attract um, native insects and stuff, which I was shattered because I love the Shenandoah switchgrass. So I'm not going to yank that out of my yard, but I am going to go get some more straight native art or uh, some straight native species to add to it. You know, mm -hmm. I think that variegated foliage also was not good for our, um, for native habitat, but, um, Again, it's been a while, but I highly recommend looking that up and finding some of those results because as that research goes on, it's going to be so helpful. The designer and me also can navigate towards Native Ours for the residential yeah. landscape, but the urban ecological restorationist in me would not use them in those projects. So I consider the, the residential landscape appropriate, but of course not our wild green spaces. Right, right. And, and I do think the main benefit of cultivars is that it gets people who would normally never consider planting a native, <clears throat> plant them, and you get people hooked. Once they get to see more swallowtails on their property, or more monarchs, whatever it is that they're drawing in, because you're going to get something new with each new edition of natives, I think. People all of a sudden get more and more interested and they start planting more and more natives. I think it's a good like gateway plant to mm -hmm. get addicted mm -hmm. to natives. So I agree. I agree. I'm going to do one last um, swoop through the chat in case I have missed anything. If anybody would like to. Um, oh, I forgot. Mary Blackburn says that she has the Terra dwarf cultivar. What species was that? I forget now. It is of the, oh, this one always gives me a hard time. For some reason, I can never remember its name. It's the shorter one. Prairie the, drop seed. Yes, thank you, Wendy. Oh, okay, the shorter prairie oh. drop seed. She said that Brehob had some. Oh, interesting. I might have to go out and get one. And, and while Brooke is looking at the chat, I just want to thank everybody who showed up. Correction. No, no, it wasn't Brehobs. Brehobs was for the some, something else someone mentioned. It okay. was, I ordered it. The, there's a little uh, garden shop um, called the Forest Flower on. Um, oh, yes, yes. And they were able to order it from their person that they have in Michigan. And it's oh. a very nice upright habit and doesn't flop over like the, the main prairie drops. Oh, I think I may have to talk to them over at Forest Flower. That's the place people used to call the 71st Street Garden Center. Yes. And they have always, I have found, been very willing to special order something for you more so than some of the other places. Um, that's who I got my original Dervilla from because nobody else had it. And when I asked them, they were willing to get it in for me. 